Hi, this is Tawny with the Kinsman Free Public Library, and I thought I would share some of the books I've been reading during our closing, just in case you yourselves were in a reading slump and you didn't know what to borrow from Libby or Overdrive, or even Hoopla. So I'm going to share some of the books that I've read that I checked out before we shut down, but also some things that I was like, oh, that's on my bookshelf? Huh, what's that about? So the first book we're going to talk about is The Invention of Murder by Judith Flanders. Basically, if you love true crime documentaries and the, just the whole genre of true crime, or even just murder mystery in general, this nonfiction read actually explores the origins of this fascination with murder as well as our love of true crime and cozy mysteries and murder mysteries and it just in general. So Judith Flanders does a great job. Like this book, it's, it is a thick read, but it goes by so quick. She goes over crimes that happened in Victorian England and also books that were written at the same time as these crimes that were directly influenced, as well as discussing plays and things called Penny Dreadfuls, which were basically Victorian tabloids at the time. So we, we've always apparently have loved our gossip and our lady discovers three-headed cow in her barn stories, as well as, did you hear so-and-so? Yeah, they, they were found murdered in their garage kind of stories. So I'm going to read you just a real quick excerpt from the beginning of the book so that you get a gist of her writing style. Because I don't want to give away too much. I don't want to give away all of her findings because that takes away the fun of reading the book and finding all these cool and fun connections between what the Victorians were interested in and then what we ourselves are still reading and watching. Chapter 1. Imagining Murder Pleasant it is, no doubt, to drink tea with your sweetheart, but most disagreeable to find her bubbling in the tea urn. So wrote Thomas de Quincey in 1826, and indeed, it is hard to argue with him. But even more pleasant, he thought, was to read about someone else's sweetheart bubbling in the tea urn. And that, too, is hard to argue with, for crime, especially murder, is very pleasant to think about in the abstract. It is like hearing blustery rain on the window pane when sitting indoors. It reinforces a sense of safety, even of pleasure, to know that murder is possible, just not here. At the start of the 19th century, it was easy to think of murder that way. Capital convictions in the London area, including all the outlying villages, were running at a rate of one a year. In all of England and Wales in 1810, just 15 people were convicted of murder out of a population of nearly 10 million. Thus, when on the night of December 7, 1811, a 24-year-old hoser named Timothy Marr his wife and their baby and a 14-year-old apprentice were all found brutally murdered in their shop on the Ratcliffe Highway in the east end of London. The cozy feeling evaporated rapidly. The year 1811 had not been kind to the working classes. The French wars had been running endlessly, and with Waterloo four years in the future, there was no sense that peace and with it prosperity would ever return. Instead, hunger ever-present was ever present. The wars and bad harvest had savagely driven up the price of bread. In the early 1790s, wheat had cost between 48 cents and 58 cents a quarter. quarter. In 1800, it was 113 cents. The murder of the Mars, however, was more dramatic than the slow deaths of many, of so many from hunger, or the fair death of soldiers and sailors in unending war and the story was soon everywhere. The Ratcliffe Highway was a busy, populous working class street in a busy, populous working class area near the docks. At around midnight on this evening of his death, Marr was ready to shut up shop. In parentheses, 
Working class shops regularly stay open until after 10 to serve their clients out on their way home after their 14 hour work days. On Saturdays, payday, many shops closed after midnight and then it closes. The hoser sent his servant, Margaret Jewell, to pay an outstanding bill at the baker's and to buy the family supper. After paying the bill, she looked for an oyster stall. Oysters were a common supper food, being cheap on sale at street stalls and needing no cooking. The first stall she came to had shut up for the night, and looking for another, she lost her bearings. Before gas lighting streets had before gas lighting, streets had only the occasional oil lamp in a window to guide passers by, and was away for longer than expected, returning around one AM. She knocked, knocked again, and she heard scuffling. Someone breathing on the other side of the door, but no one opened it. She stopped the parish watchman on his rounds, telling him she knew the Mars were in. She had even heard them, but no one was answering the door. He had passed by earlier, he said, and had tapped on the window to tell Mar that one of his shutters was loose. A man called out, We know it! Now he wondered who had spoken. Their talking attracted the attention of Mar's next-door neighbor, a pawnbroker. From his window, he could see that the Mar's back door was open. All right, and that is just the lead up for her first murder case that she's going to discuss and all of the repercussions around it. If you want to find out what the grisly murders of Jack the Ripper and other such gruesome murders like Sweeney Todd have to do with our current fascination with murder mystery, as well as m mysteries like Miss Marple series or just pick a cozy mystery you might be into and what that could have to do with true crime as well as the more grisly fascination with serial killers and murder in and of itself. Check this book out. It is available on Cleavnet in Overdrive and as well as once holds are being accepted again through the Cleavnet catalog, you will be able to physically check this book out as well. As I said, this one happens to be my own copy. I bought it when I worked in a bookstore because I was super intrigued by the idea and then just never read it and then finally got a chance and I was like, holy cranky, this was so good and worth it. So anyway, give it a shot. I think if you really love true crime or if you just want a good story, because if there's anything this book taught me is murder makes a great story. Give this a shot. It's not overly gruesome. She's not sharing pictures of the Ripper case. She's not sharing drawings and paintings of all the other cases. She's just very non-sensationally telling the story that the Victorians themselves told. All right. Thanks for listening. And I hope you read it. Please tell me if you give this book a shot or if you want to give this book a shot because much like my cat ate my eyeballs, will my cat eat my eyeballs? I can't stop reading these more morbid nonfiction books. There's just something grotesquely fascinating about topics that are taboo like death and murder, and I can't pull myself away from them. So let me know if you're in this club, because I really don't want to feel alone over here. Thanks. Bye.